entrepreneurs, businesses, um, anyone and everyone that just want to learn how to get started with it and they don't know how, um, be it what gear to use or how to, you know, get started with YouTube and they just want a little bit more info and insight and um, you know, one of our guests in here is Jessica Campos and she, she's an amazing person. She puts on one of the best networking events in Austin, but you know, she can attest to it. Usually at her networking events, I'll, I'll share three tips about, you know, how to make your videos better. Um, but tonight I'm just going to unload all of the, you know, secrets to making videos on your smartphone or camera and, you know, just the basics of how to get started on YouTube. So does anybody have any questions about that before we even get into it or get started or um, for me or media pouch or anything like that. And feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions. Yes, unmute yourself if you guys have a question. I don't mind being interrupted at all. Hi, Ryan. This is Jessica. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm so excited <laughs> to put my student seat here. Um, and I just need to tell you that this week actually was my first, very first uh, YouTube video. Um, and then I have actually a question and I would love to hear your insights. What okay. I realized is that there's a big difference between uploading YouTube, uploading videos to YouTube and producing a YouTube marketing yeah. channel. So yeah. I, will, I would love to hear like your ins and outs about that because I did my first produced video, you know, pretty much following the same blogging strategy. It took me 11 hours, so please help. <laughs> okay, all right. I think, I think for the most part, we will cover the, the upload and the channel and all that good stuff. So I think, I think I've got you covered on this one. Thank you. No worries. Anybody else? Okay, well, I'm going to get into it. So the, the three main things that we're going to talk about today are the, like, the gear and the settings and tips that you can use on your smartphone um, to actually just produce the videos on your iPhone, Android, anything like that. And then we're going to get into the best tips for like starting an actual YouTube channel and then posting on YouTube. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of our process and why these videos work and how they work and stuff like that. So the first thing for tips, you know, we've got 10 of them, but the first one is always to use a stabilizer. So it's probably a different word that you've never heard of before, but a stabilizer is something that you put your camera on and it's going to hold it steady. So just like right now, you're, you're seeing a very steady image of myself. Like that's on a tripod, um, which is stationary, but you know, a tripod serves this purpose right here. That's when you would use a tripod, but a stabilizer is when you're going to be moving on the go and you want the footage to be very, very steady. So, this is something that you would hold in your hand and you know the camera can be facing you or it can be facing outwards, but it's gonna allow you to get really, really smooth cinematic footage. Um, so always grab a, some kind of stabilizer. Um, even if you don't buy one, the best thing that you can do um, if you're really just in a pinch and don't have it on you or don't wanna buy one is just hold both of your arms out like that. And that's the best way that you can get really smooth footage like that. Um, let's see, so the iPhone digital zoom. So you'll never, a lot of people will, you can always zoom in on your phone and make the video or picture, you know, more up close to you, but you never wanna use the, use the zoom. You never wanna pinch in on your screen and record video like that because it causes a ton of pixelation on your video. And that's that's what you don't want. You don't want pixelation. You want your video to look exactly like this, where I, you know, I'm not zoomed in at all on this lens. I'm exactly 24 millimeters where I want it to be. And that's created the perfect distance from my face to the camera lens uh, to create what you're seeing right now. Um, Unless the only other option is if you do have one of the newer iPhones like the 11 or I'm not very familiar with Androids, but maybe they have the feature. Um, if they have a digital optical zoom, those are the only kinds of zooms that you would actually want to use on a camera because in that instance, it's not going to cause pixelation or anything like that. So if you have the optical zoom, use it. Um, but if you don't, you know, just get as close as you can or far away from the subject. 
um, yourself or whatever uh, to create that distance that you want. Okay, so the next one we've got is lighting your video. I have a quick question. Oh, yeah, you mentioned stabilizers. Do you have yep. a brand, um, uh, a, an affordable brand that you recommend for a stabilizer? Yep, so there's, I will put the link to um, a, a kit that I've created for, uh, for your smartphones essentially. And it's got all of the, everything that I'm gonna talk about here with the stabilizers and tripods and mics and everything like that. It's a fully built out kit where all you gotta do is click it and then it takes you to the Amazon link. But your, the most noticeable ones, not noticeable, but the best ones I would recommend are the Mosey DJI. Um, you don't, you know, it, you get what you pay for, right? So I, I have skewed everything on that kit to be on the cheaper end, but still good quality. And the Mosey one that's out there does pretty good quality and it's pretty affordable. So. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, on that stabilizer question, yep. you, you motioned holding your hands, your arms straight out. Yep. But you, what you mean is holding the phone with two hands as opposed to one. Yep. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to see if I held it all the way out like that. You mean just stabilizing with two hands, even if your elbows are bent? Well, it depends. Like, how are you? Like, what's the example? What's the example that you're using of like shooting? Because if you're, if you're vlogging, right? Like, yes, you're gonna want to bend it a little bit and have two hands on there. But if you're if you're doing video outwards, like recording something that's in front of you, then you want your elbows to be locked out like that. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna get into lighting. So. Um, Right, just from my video alone, I look pretty well lit, um, if you can tell. But that's because I have, I have a light stand right behind my camera that's lighting me, which is the foreground, and that's how I create a depth of the field behind myself. So, um, you know, I'm actually not even using a webcam. Uh, I'm using my actual camera with a link, so that's why the video quality looks pretty darn good compared to what you'll normally see on Zoom. And we'll get we'll get into that one in a little bit here, but. The main thing is lighting and you'd be surprised how cheap you can get some of these lighting fixtures for your iPhone or even just the, the light stand in this like that I'm using here in my home office. Um, they're very affordable and it makes all the difference in the world because the I can, you know, I'm looking at my screen right now. Everything is very nice and well lit. It's saturated and it, it makes a very, very big difference. Um, so always use lighting, whether it's, you know, for internal use, like here in your home office, or um, even if you're, you know, out at dusk, um, use a light. It it makes a night and day difference, like quite literally. And then let's see the exposure lock. So in your iPhone, there is a feature where you can, like, when you're taking. I know I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this or not, but you can lock your exposure by just tapping on there like that. So if I just tap my phone and then there's a little, there's a little uh, sun that comes out right there. I can actually then go up and down on my iPhone and you can let's see, you can kind of, you can see the, how it's going dark to bright like that. And that's how you can lock your, your exposure. So a lot of people don't know about that one, but once you lock, you know, once I just tap like that, and the camera knows where to focus, I can then lock my exposure and I can have it be brighter or darker depending on what look I'm going for. Uh, let's see, an external mic. So this one right here that I'm using, this is a Blue Yeti microphone and this is the, this is what they, you would consider a studio mic, um, but it's, it's got the USB so I just plug it right into my Mac and it's, it's actually really, really good. Um, for doing things like this, where I don't have a whole lot of movement going on, I'm going to be stationary. It picks up really good audio, and it's you know on the cheaper end of microphones like that. But you know it goes both ways for both your Mac, laptop, everything, um, home base, but also for your um, for your phone as well. Like you can get lav mics, and that's what I would highly recommend um, for anybody to get if they're going to do any kind of vlogging where they're walking and talking. And a lav mic is just something that it just clips right there on your collar or here on your shirt and you just plug it right into your phone. And 
the reason that you want to get a, a lav mic is because it, it picks up your audio way, way cleaner and it makes it sound just like this. Um, you know, it makes, it makes you sound more professional and that's what you're really going for in, in these videos. Like you want it to be nice and smooth, well lit, and you want the audio to be, um, sound really, really good. Okay. And then the next one, this is probably the most problematic one that I see every single person do even, even other videographers and photographers that I know, they don't know about this one that they can change it. And it's probably the most important one if you're going to be shooting video on your phone. But if you go, like when you record a video on your phone and you don't change anything, it's actually shot at 4K 60 frames per second. And that probably sounds like a different language to most people right now. And so what 60 frames per second really means, and I'm going to break it down for you because there's three, there's three frames per second that, um, like you want to know about in video. The first one's 60 frames per second. Your next one is 30 frames per second. And then the last one is 24 frames per second. So 24 frames per second is what's going to give you that nice, smooth cinematic footage that you would see on a Hollywood theater. So think about that. And then 30 frames per second, which is what I'm shooting on right now. Like that's what you guys are watching on this video, 30 frames per second. And so you want to, correlate 30 frames per second to like a news news channel. Like that's what you're watching on the news. That's what Zoom's recording in. That's what I'm recording in. And it gives it that really personable feel where the audio is matching my mouth and it's linking up with the video. And then 60 frames per second. Um, you would never use 60 frames per second unless you're going to do some kind of slow motion video. Because the reason for 60 frames per second is to slow down your video like you want the extra frames so that you can create slow motion but if you're never if you're not using if you're not creating slow motion videos then it's really pointless to use it because essentially it's it's going double as fast as like however i'm talking and it makes it look very choppy and like unrealistic um like the pixels look really good on it and it looks like a sharp image in a video but it it doesn't look good. And so like what you want to do is you want to go into your settings on your, uh, just go into settings and then you would go into general and then, or you can just type in, you would just type in camera settings. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So camera settings and then you want to do, so there's record video, right? Let's see. Here we go like that. So record video and you just want to set that to 4K24. And you're going to have a ton of options like that, but 4K24 is always going to be the best one for for your iPhone videos. So always 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 like no matter even if it is on an iPhone or Android or regular camera, 9 times out of 10 you want to be shooting at 24 frames per second. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And so the, the next one, this, this next one's kind of controversial, right? It, it really depends because a lot of things have changed um, in the last year or so in terms of how we consume video, because the tip is to always shoot horizontal, right? Because that's what YouTube takes. That's what Facebook takes. Um, Vimeo, like websites, it's everything's horizontal 16 by nine. And so if you're making a video for the most part, you, all, like 90% you want to always shoot horizontal because that's going to create, it just looks more cinematic. It creates, you know, your depth of field. You can see more around you. Um, but if you know for a fact that you're going to just be posting your videos on Instagram, then you want to shoot vertical because Instagram is a totally vertical app and shooting horizontal actually doesn't give you that much more advantage on Instagram because you'll take up more screen space on, um, on Instagram by shooting vertical. So, you know, it's one of those things you want to think about before you start shooting. Like, am I put, where am I putting it on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter? Um, and if it's Instagram vertical, but if it's not, then you want to shoot horizontal like that. Um, and then 
the next one plays into the horizontal and the vertical aspect, right? So the rule of thirds. So if you, I don't think you have to turn this one on as well. Um, so if you go to, let's see, where is it at? Grid, yes. Yeah. So in the same camera settings that I told you to go to, you'll see grid. And once you have grid on there, that's gonna populate the grids, like essentially rule of thirds on there. And it gives you the, let's see, it gives you those bars on there just like that. And so when you're shooting video, you always want your subject to be, I'm gonna look at my screen so I can demonstrate, but right in the middle. So right in the middle would be right there. But the rule of thirds says that there's gonna be two lines. There's always gonna be two lines just right there, up and down. And then there's gonna be one top one like that and then one bottom one just like that. And so rule of thirds says that you need to be in the middle just like that and your, your eyes or forehead should be hitting that top line. So if you can see my video, I'm actually perfectly aligned in, in rule of thirds right now. But let's say that you wanna add you know, a different kind of feel to the video. That's when you would you know, place your subject over here. You know, I could place myself over here and it gives kind of a different vibe. Or I would go to the other rule of thirds on the right side there and I would use that one. But you always want your subject to either be in between the two lines or right on one of the left or right lines. Does anybody have questions about that one? No? Okay. Uh, the next one is use a manual camera app. So there's a, there's a camera app out there called Film Mic Pro. And essentially this gives you more, just like a camera, like you have a ton of settings on there and you have way more control over the camera, like your ISO, your exposure, your aperture. Um, that app does the same thing except for your iPhone. So if you download that, that's gonna give you full control of how to use your iPhone and turning it into a, essentially a DSLR camera or mirrorless camera. So highly recommend that, but it's, it's one of those apps where, you know, I would learn the other things of, you know, shooting horizontal and really getting a feel for your iPhone first to, before you start using the app, because the app will add a little bit more complexity to it. It, it looks like they have, um, on this Film Mic Pro, they have, uh, it looks like it's $14.99. Uh, is there, is that the, is that yep. the price? That's the yep. one that you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, it is a, the app you do have to purchase, but it's, it's one of those things where if you know that you're going to be spending a lot of time on your iPhone and doing a lot of your videos on it, it's, it's a hundred percent worth it because it'll make your videos look 10 times better. So um, let's see, our last tip that we have is to use multiple focus link or focal links. Um, so the first one that I gave was about not using the pinch in or whatever on the screen and create the digital zoom. And so with focal links, that's when you actually just want to, you know, move closer to your subject and, you know, create that actual um, beat that you're trying to capture in there. But the other way that you can get around that is um, by buying third party lenses. So I don't personally use any of the third party lenses, but they're, they're very good. Right. And they, all they do is they just go over your iPhone, camera just like that and it creates um you know whether you're going for 24 millimeters or 35 millimeters or 60 millimeters you just would put that one on and then it, it'll create that zoom for you and that's the best option um if you want to you know get that focal length without moving closer or farther away and so i will here's that does it for the gear tips but I'm gonna take this link that we have in here and I'm just gonna post it in the chat. And so all you, all you guys can go and check out that kit and that has um, you know, everything that I just covered from audio to lighting to uh, third party uh, camera polarizers and everything, it, it's all on there. So you guys can check that out. Um, and I would highly recommend to grab you know, something like that to stabilize your footage or the app or something. So is there any questions 
on the gear that I've recommended or the tips before we move into the YouTube stuff? I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I bought this shotgun mic because I have been making educational videos for my students. I'm a teacher. And I was under the impression that that shotgun mic was going to work as it, like, it was going to get my voice. I move around a lot, so I don't just sit there static because my kids are tiny. So I'm very dynamic with them. And that microphone sucks. Can you explain why a shotgun mic didn't work for me, even though I spent about $200 on it? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're moving around a lot and you're the only person that's going to be talking, lav mics are the way to go because it's, it's six inches away from you. And there's, I mean, shotgun mics, you have to be within a certain distance, right? Because it's just like with this studio mic, it, it's kind of the same set up a little bit. So if, if I move away and I start talking over here, right? It, <laughs> It gets kind of harder to hear because I'm not within the, the I'm not within the the distance that it needs it me to be. Because like with studio mics, I need to be six to twelve inches away from it. Um, same thing with a shotgun mic. It's only going to do. It's only going to pick up what is around it for the most part. And um, to be honest, I don't use a whole. We don't use a whole ton of like shotgun mics because they are just kind of hit or miss and the really good ones are expensive. So I would highly recommend like, you know, if you're doing stuff like this to get a studio mic where it's just going to be right there next to you, or, you know, if you're going to be walking and talking and vlogging, then just get that block to get the, the lav mic. Cause that vlog, the lav mic that I have out there, it's only 20 bucks and yeah. I've compared it to 300 and $500 lav mics and it stays right up there with them. So, you know, I don't know. I can't tell you why the shotgun mic didn't perform the way that it needed to, but um, I know the best solution for iPhones and what goes best with them. So that lav mic that you're recommending works with iPhones? Yeah, you just have to, you just get one of those dongles and then it plugs right in and then you're good to go. And is there like wiring or am I wire free? It's or wired, like yeah, it's wired. It I would not. Close. Say it again. I still would have to be close to the camera and not- Can, can I jump in far? here? Because I, I have a lavalier that fits into my iPhone um, and I use a dongle and my lavalier has like an eight foot um, cord. And when I know I'm gonna be close to my iPhone, I just sort of wrap up the cord. And when I know I'm gonna be farther away, then I have the, I have the, the the length of the wire um yeah yeah and it's it works great just like ryan says it's close to your mouth it's on your shirt so the sound quality is much better okay yeah um i'm sorry i'm they, i'm watching my kids and killing each other over here that's okay thank, <laughs> thank you yeah um and then can I get any juice out of that shotgun mic? I'm starting a podcast, but I, I don't think the quality is good. Can I use it for something? The, is, it, is the shotgun mic meant for, is it for an iPhone or is it for, the, for an actual camera? It's, it's a USB um, and it's, how does it work? Yeah, it plugs in with USB directly into my phone. And it, it can plug into your phone? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a USB connected. What, what brand is it? I can't remember. I bought it about yeah. six months ago and and it was almost two hundred dollars and I got it from some kind of YouTuber that recommended it and that's all I did. That was my research. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, let's let's connect after this and then I can we can try to figure out what brand it is and um yeah. what what the how to optimize it best. So let we'll connect after the the Zoom okay. meeting. Thank you very much. I, I, I left you a question on the on yep. the board. Yeah, so memory. Um, as far as I know, there's, I don't know a way to actually record from your iPhone onto an external drive. I know exactly what you're talking about and I do it with all the cameras. We, I record all to like the external drives, but for an iPhone, I'm not sure. Um, the, I mean, what, what, 
what all do you have on this iPhone? What it you should be because like for me, like if I'm recording something, as soon as I record it on my iPhone or even my photos, I'll do this once a month. I just take everything that's on this iPhone, be it any kind of content, photo, video, and then I just put it onto my Mac or I store it up in our Google Drive or I, I put it on an external hard drive. So then that way this thing's always freed up with space. Yeah, I need to get better at that. And another issue that I caught is that um, I, I had another iPhone and then my daughter all of a sudden decided that they want to do YouTube videos as well. So they use the same uh, iTunes account. So everything that they that they record, it's coming to my I, to my cell phone as well. Mm. So yeah, I just need to do that massive clean of them. Yeah, I, I that's probably that's your best bet. I would honestly get um, I would get an external hard drive like one of these bad boys, um, and just plug it into your Mac. And whenever you have stuff that's on your phone just plug this into your Mac and just take them and put them onto it. So then that way it keeps your iPhone fast because the, you know, you've got tons of storage on it and then everything's on one place. So you're not having to mess with iTunes or anything. Cause like the, your audio, I mean, you can store your stuff in iTunes for sure, but it's just like you said, you run, if you're sharing an account, then you're going to run into that issue where if you have a dedicated external hard drive like this, it's always going to be separate no matter what, like, you're never going to have any kind of issues of it being lost as long as you manage the data correctly and name everything. Well, generally speaking, um, if you were going to, to record, let's say, you know, with an empty iPhone, how many hours does that take? How many hours of memory does it have? With the, the iPhone? Yep. Well, so mine's, I mean, what, this one's a 64 gig. What's, what's yours? Same. Same. So, I mean, I have, I always have plenty of space on this. I mean, it, I can't say that even for the vlogging stuff that we do for, for clients, like we never go over two hours of record time. And even in those two hours of recording time, I mean, we're knocking out anywhere from four to 12, 12 videos, you know, in that two hour session. So, I mean, you can store audio on there. You can eat. Cause even if you like, if you're going to do it on your iPhone, what you can do as well is just keep your Mac with you. And then just after each video, that's, you know, say 10, 20 minutes, just offload it onto your Mac. And so then that way you're keeping your storage there if that's an issue, but that's a, that's a good question. Makes sense. I guess I take a lot of selfies then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I take think... a lot of space, the Instagram stories, every time I do them, they just get there. They just get saved. I mean, if I do IGTV, that gets saved. And then it's yep. always that, um, like, oh, I, I'm afraid that I might use that content or repurpose that. And in that, it's that fear of, like, I need it for the future. Well, the future is, like, two years, and they're still there. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Like, I, I always joke with people that I own a media production company, but I'm also an IT manager because – it, there's some serious data management that goes into doing video and stuff because the files get so big. Um, but I would, I really think like one of these would be your best friend for you to just buy one of these. And then, you know, this one's like a terabyte, grab one and then just put all your video stuff on there and organize it the right way and keep it off of your iPhone. Got it. Thank you. What else you guys got? Well, I guess uh, if you can talk about pre-production, production, like if yep. I want to do that YouTube, you yep. know, show. Yep. We'll get into the YouTube stuff right now then. All right. So the best tips for starting a YouTube channel. Um, I would say that the first thing that you need to do when it comes to just creating content is you just need to set aside time to, you know, actually build the content, make the content, storyboard it, like just schedule four hours a week, just creating content, right? Like, even if it's just like this, like this for me, like we're recording it, I'll probably use it as some kind of content later on in the year, month, whatever. Um, but just set aside the four hours per week and do all your scheduling, like all of that stuff. Um, which leads me into my next point, create a con content calendar. Like if you're, 
if you really want to, you know, grow the YouTube channel, you want to be posting stuff that is trending, right? So holidays, um, you know, topics of interest, like national day of, you know, whatever, um, you know, right now, like you've got a lot of the, the number one thing right now on YouTube trending is at home workouts, right? So if you're starting a YouTube channel, that be, that would be probably one of the first things that I'd talk about. And you're probably thinking, you know, I don't know what everybody's background is. Maybe some of you guys are in finance, banking, whatever, but there's always some kind of way that you can link into that trend. So, um, you know, for, you know, example, media production, right? We can help you live stream those at-home workouts to show your audience. You know, if you're in finance, it's like, hey, these are the things that you'll need for at-home workouts, but did you know that you don't have to buy these things? You can rent them or you can finance them because like interest rates are so low right now. Like you just want to always create a video that's trending. And that's the point of, of a content calendar, right? Cause it can go anywhere from a week to three weeks to a year, a month, however long you want. So do you have any tools that you use to find out what's trending? Um, in terms of trending the, and I'll get into this one a little bit later, but there's not an actual tool that, that I use to see what's trending, but I look at the keywords that are trending, like for, for what I'm posting. Right. Because, um, I think, well, I think Twitter is like a really good place to see what's trending. Um, I think that there's tons of free social media content calendars out there as well that will help you like identify the national days of and the holidays and then just other stuff like that, that you can build out around. Um, so those are out there, but you really want, you know, within that trend, you want to find the right keyword for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next one is owning your expertise. So the, the reason I say that one is because you don't want to, like if you're, if you're trying to get in the video and you just want to make a YouTube channel and make cool videos and you know, like that's it, then you're like, people aren't going to go there and, and watch it because they're just going to be confused about what you're doing. You know, one day you post, um, you know, family stuff, then the next day you're talking about business and then the next day you're working out. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like people are, people want some kind of consistency to your brand and to your channel no matter what platform. And so talk about your expertise, like what every single person on in this, on the world is an expert at something like there's everybody in this room. There's probably one thing that I want to learn from them that they're an expert at and just talk about that. Right. Because there's like where you're at, somebody else wants to get to, and you just always have to remember that. So there's always going to be people that want to learn about something and they're going to watch and they're going to listen and they're going to learn. So always talk about your expertise. And then, um, oh, this is a big one uh, that I run into all the time with clients. Um, if you're talking about your expertise and you're providing actual good content and teaching people about something and providing them value, they don't care about what you look like. Um, so you just got to stop worrying about what you look like. Like legitimately you do because people are not there to check you out or, you know, rate you or anything like that or judge you. They're just there to learn something. And that's what you have to, you have to get in the mindset of because uh, it, it's all about providing the value, not, not about how you look. So just remember that one when you're making the videos. And then let's see. Yeah. So set up, uh, just keep it simple, right? There's no, there's no need to go out and spend, especially getting started, like to go and spend like thousands of dollars on these cameras and lenses and all the other stuff that's super expensive to make YouTube videos because a lot of some of the most famous vloggers out there on YouTube, they're all, some of them just use their iPhone, right? And they're just using the 10 tips that I shared with you how to make those videos and they make them look good. So just keep it simple um, and just focus on, focus on the creation of that video, right? Like don't focus about, you know, 
anything else, like how you look or anything, but just the creation. Like, what does it look? What does it feel like? How, what vibes are you trying to get off in it? Like, what are you trying to educate the pe person on? What are you trying to, what kind of value are you kind of trying to provide? And, and what does that look like? So just focus on the creation of it. Um, which, which leads me into the next one. The content calendars are really good and they'll keep you on track with posting your videos and stuff, but don't worry so much about the strategy at first. Like just focus on creating the videos and building out a library because essentially once you have your library, you can go back and re-edit like how that looks in your YouTube channel or Instagram or whatever. Like there's tons of apps out there that'll let you reprogram what it looks like in terms of strategy because the strategy is to just get people on your YouTube channel and get them to see you and you provide value and that in turn helps your business get results. Like that's the main goal. That's the main strategy. So the more content you have out there, and the bigger library you have, the, the better it is because you're going to come off and look at like people are going to view you as the authoritarian, right? The credible person, the person that knows what they're talking about um, when they see all of that content in there. So they're going to stay on your channel longer, consume it more. And those are super, super important things. And then let's see the, yes, this one. Um, I've seen a lot of people do this as well. Um, and it, it really, it's a, it becomes a bottleneck, but when you're, when you're going to spend those four hours per week to create your videos, knock out four to five, like legitimately knock out four to five. And that's the only way that I do it with our clients at media pouch. Like I don't even, if they're doing some kind of vlog videos, um, you know, where they're talking to their audience all the time, all we do is we'll do monthly sessions and we do anywhere from four to eight to 12 videos per, per month with them. And it's so that they have, and the reason it's four, uh, four videos, it's, you know, one video per week or two videos per week, three per week, four per week, whatever. But you just want to create the, like a batch amount of videos so that you have consistency of when you're posting those videos and how much is going out. Um, because it's a lot harder to just shoot one video per week, every single week, because there's a ton that goes into it. You know, the storyboard, like writing it down, you're gonna probably, it's gonna take you four or five takes just to get it right. Um, and that's everybody, right? You know, it takes me 10 takes just to get in front of the camera and get the exact message out there. So it takes a lot of time and that's why you wanna do it in batches. And then, um, the other big bottleneck that I would be aware of when you're doing these videos is if you've never edited a video before, it's going to be quite challenging to do that for the first time um, for a lot of reasons, because, you know, you can go in your iPhone and just do the start and end. And that that's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when you're making these videos and putting them on YouTube, they need to be edited a certain way. Like there needs to be, you're going to have to take all the ums and all the times that you, you know, me like looking up at the screen, like that's not good. Right. But I would take all those out. I would take the ums out. You're going to take the mess ups out and that requires editing like in applications like Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro. And so it's very, there's a learning curve to it, right? And everybody is very capable of doing it. But when you're first starting out, I would, I would highly recommend just go on Fiverr and see if you can find an editor that fits into your budget that will edit those videos in a timely manner that is good quality, right? Um, because that's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Because you know, you guys are business owners, entrepreneurs, teachers, you know, all kinds of industries and job titles. Um, but I don't think there's one person in here that's that's a videographer or editor, right? Um, and so, you know, you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, do I want to learn it? Do I not want to learn it? Because there's a lot of time that goes into it. Um, so utilize I have, Fiverr. Uh, yep. I have my kids. I have my kid. He, he's <laughs> old and he's, oh my gosh, we actually bought Final Cut Pro. He's like, oh, mom, yes, now I can do that. Oh, he's great. He's been doing YouTube since he was seven years old. Perfect. So he, he's a master. 
awesome. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody that already knows what they're doing with it. You want to you want to let them do it. If you need help, he can be your he can be your intern. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So I have a question. So like, which one would you recommend out of the video editing programs? Like, do you think Final Cut Pro, Premiere, or even like Vegas Pro? Yep. Good question. Um, especially right now, there's a lot of things changing in the tech world. So it depends what, um, well, I guess what, um, setup you have, because I have always right now I, I use a Mac and I've always used Macs and they've been great. And I've just run the dual screens and everything like that. And it's worked flawlessly with premiere, but, um, Apple is actually, they're swapping out the Intel chips for their own chips now. And all of the third party software apps like uh, Premiere and DaVinci and Vega and all of those ones, they're, it, it's gonna take them three years essentially to catch up and build out their new software programs for Macs. So um, it depends you know, what your setup is first um, and then what your preference is because they all essentially do the same thing and each of them has their own power to it. Like DaVinci is very, very good for color grading. Final Cut Pro is very good if you have a Mac and um, you know, it's very fast. Like that's the one thing about Final Cut Pro is it's fast. Um, and then Premiere Pro, I would say Premiere Pro is what a majority, I, and when I say majority, I mean 95% of media production, Hollywood, everybody uses to make their videos is Premiere Pro because it's seamless across the board. I can create a team project with you right now and you would be able to see it live, what I'm doing, editing, and you could be editing at the same time. So that's where the par power is on that. Um, but I can also, I can take it a step further and say that I'm not gonna be using a Mac here in about a month because I'm building out my own custom PC. So then that way I can still use Premiere Pro and have it be fast because if I keep using a Mac in a month when they swap out those chips and there's no more support for them, um, it's kind of a, you know, it's like, what do you do? <laughs> like no support, no anything. So it's just kind of a retired asset at that point. Like the computer works great, but not for the applications that I, I need it to. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers perfectly. Um, if you don't mind me asking, have you ever used Vegas Pro by chance? I haven't. Um, I've, I've only, I've only used Premiere Pro and DaVinci because those are the ones that, um, they're like when you, I guess to answer it, um, like when you're outsourcing so much work and you have different people working on different projects for you, uh, you'll, you'll learn that everybody uses Premiere and it's the, it's the easiest way to do business. Um, across the board with people or, and even around the world is through Premiere. So that's why, that's why I stick between Premiere and DaVinci because um, it's nice with color grading. I can take it into DaVinci and color grade, but then bring it back into Premiere to actually edit and work on it with the team. Okay, I have two questions. Yes. So first, about the chip that they're swapping out you know this for sure? Where, where yeah. did you find out? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Like, you can go on any, any website that talks about apples and uh, editing and stuff, but all of Mac's new, um, you know, laptops that they're going to be producing have, have their own new Apple. Uh, so that's not gonna, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Um, so then it, they're not going to be as user-friendly for video? Is that what's going to end up happening? Correct. You'll be able to use Final Cut Pro on a Mac. Um, and that's why I said it. It depends on what system you're on. Because if you're going to use Final Cut Pro, then the new Macs are just fine for you. And that's, you'll be just fine. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've, got a, I've, got a MacBook, I've got a MacBook Pro. And I've got Premiere. And I've got Final Cut. That's okay. what I'm working with right now. Yep. So Premiere, Premiere Pro will be will start to become an issue, um, probably in the next six months because it'll start. They'll stop doing the software updates for it and everything like that, and you won't have any kind of. Essentially, you know, they're just going to stop putting resources into that Premiere Pro with that version of Mac. And that's, you're, it's gonna be way slower to edit and everything. And, it, and it's something where I'm like, it's worth spending 
three grand on building out a new custom PC because I want to keep on using Premiere and I want need it to be fast, right? But yeah, um, I'm, I'm not saying you got to go to that extreme. That's that's just us. <laughs> but but that's there's what, that that really bums me out. <laughs> yeah, I trust me. I, I get it. I use, I have an, I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have a Mac. I have Apple everything. So to switch over yeah. to PC, is not, it's not ideal for me, but it, yeah, it is what it we're is. On the, now I do have a, a different question uh, as far as editing goes. Keeping that file size down, is that important? And when I'm exporting, does that matter the way that I export video? A hundred percent. There is, there is a ton. So I, what's your question with exporting? Huh? Okay, so I'm, I, I always edit it on Final Cut Pro, and I just, there's an option there where it says, you know, export to YouTube, and it's linked to my channel, but I don't ever check the settings, like how big the file size is, what the compression is like, I just start uploading, but then I want to save a version on my computer, and it's humongous, and then my drive starts to get cold. Do you have any tips on, like, specific ways to export my video? so that I have a compressed video, but still lose a whole bunch of quality. Yeah, I mean, I'll start by saying like, you never wanna, you never wanna compress the video unless you have to, unless you're forced to. Like you always want it to be, um, you want the max resolution and the max bit rate and the max depth and render and all that good stuff. Um, but it's, it's very specific to what platform that you're posting on because for, for us, like, you know, in Premiere Pro, they have the a drop down list, and you can export to YouTube at 2160K. You can export to Facebook at 2160K. You can export to Vimeo at that same, and then you can export mobile, right? And so, for most clients of ours, we, you know, that's what we do. Like, we'll use that specific export setting in Premiere, and then that's, we just label the different videos. So, it, it might be one video. But I know that our clients are going to post it on Twitter, you know, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, whatever. But there's different export settings that you've got to use for each of those platforms in order to maintain your quality. Um, so I would just, I would recommend just clicking the one, that, the one that's in there because you can, you can go out there on YouTube and find the best export settings for, um, for these platforms. And I've done it, right? I've done a ton of research on it. And it ends up not even being that big of a difference compared to what Premiere or Final Cut has as their preset. So I would just save yourself some time and just click the preset in there. You're on mute. Sorry. Okay, so I'm a teacher and we don't know what we're gonna face yet, but we do know that we're gonna have to teach virtually for a while. And it's more than likely that we're gonna keep our files up in some sort of Google Drive. Do you recommend anything for the video files um, if, if I'm saving it on Google Drive? Like, what do you mean? Like where to store them or? No, like, like what is a good kind of um, format for saving a file on Google Drive that parents will probably access through maybe a QuickTime player or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you always want to export the videos to be .mp4, right? You always want your, your files to be .mp4. And preferably with the codec H.264 or H.265. But See, that just comes that terrible. comes down to what you're shooting on. So it's an iPhone 11. Yeah, so it'll it'll be the H.264. 264. Got it. Thank you. Yep. No worries. Anyone else before we get into posting on YouTube? Because this is the fun stuff with the posting to YouTube. I guess I, I have the same issue um, that Michelle Hayes is having is that when I, and I use Premiere, and thank goodness I have a PC. Um, when, I, um, when I go to export and I'm gonna put it in Instagram or I wanna put it on YouTube, yep. it's like, um, like you said, with Instagram, you have to film vertical, but if I put that same video on YouTube, it, you know, it, it looks it's, like what you see on television when somebody did their own video, um, on the news, look, he shot it. Um, so it seems like you have to like 
do it twice. Yep. A hundred percent. Like that's what makes editing. So <laughs> it's so time consuming, right? Because, um, you can't just do one export and have it map all of the different, the different platforms. Like if I'm even on Instagram, I export four different ways for our clients sometimes. And that's in a one by one aspect ratio. That's in a four by five aspect ratio and a 16 by nine aspect ratio and a nine by 16 aspect ratio. And it's all for the different ways that you can post on Instagram because the story is a nine by 16 and then a landscape post is 16 by nine. But then the, you know, if I, if they want it vertical or maybe the kind of vertical, but a square, then you got to do four by five, one by one. And those are all, that's four different sequences. So if I bring all that footage into Premiere, I have, it's not just one sequence that I'm exporting. I'm exporting four different sequences because they've got to be in those four different aspect ratios. So, so you can't actually shoot once, but edit yep. twice. Oh, uh, yep, exactly. So in other words, um, if, that's if, what I, I, if I shoot once for, let's say, because I'm a voice actress, I'm shooting myself, like do whatever. And I want to post it on Instagram, but I also want to post it on YouTube. I guess I just need to make sure that I myself fit in a certain thing so that when I crop it down for Instagram, yep. it, does and that make sense? Is that? Yep. It makes a hundred percent sense. Like, and that's why you want to shoot horizontal and use the rule of thirds. Because if you look at, right, I'm going to point at the camera, but look at my screen. But if you look at my video right now, this is a landscape 16 by nine video. So I can post this on YouTube or Facebook and it's going to look just fine. But if I want to now take this to Instagram and post it vertically, well, guess what? Like I'm, I'm, I'm in a four by five dimension. So it's going to export perfectly. Like I'm going to be in focus, everything. So if you shoot and you know where you're going to post it, you'll, you'll be fine. Right. Because even in Premiere now, they've got this amazing new feature that came out where they, what is it called? Um, essentially, it takes your video from a landscape and you can tell it to just auto frame and auto crop to a four by five aspect ratio. And it's going to put it, like if I'm here, it's going to crop it and do everything for you. Which I've is seen amazing. that. I've seen that. I've tried to play with it, but I, I don't think I've been very successful. <laughs> I mean, talk about a time saver. That's the best thing that they've come out with in the last year. Yeah. All right. Did I answer everybody's questions on that one? Cool. Okay. So let's get into a little bit more technical stuff. I know that was pretty technical with the questions, um, which I loved. I wasn't expecting that, but I love it. So the technical side of posting on YouTube. So let's talk about keywords and channels and playlists and all that good stuff now, because this is super, super interesting. Um, where do I want to start here? Um, let's talk about sharing your channel. Um, because your channel first needs to be shared to Facebook or YouTube or not YouTube, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, um, somewhere or LinkedIn so that it has, it's like a check mark on the algorithm. Like let's put it in its basic term, basic terms, but it checks a box in that algorithm department and it makes your play your channel more findable. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So channel keywords, uh, this is super important because you're going to want to input keywords for your channel and recommendations, um, based on what you are creating content about. So like for me, for media pouch, um, our, key, our keywords are based around different, different things, right? Like real estate, automotive, uh, vlogs, business. Um, so we've got those different keywords in there, right? And I was able to narrow down like the specific keywords that I wanted to use within those industries because I went and stole our competitors keywords that they use. Like these guys are, you know, they've grown a very successful YouTube channel. They have over 20,000 followers. Their content is always engaged and you can go in there and steal anybody's keywords if you want, because all you do is you go to their channel, you right click and you click uh, view page source. And then once you're in all of this code, just don't get intimidated. 
you just do command F and put keywords and then you can see what all of your competitors keywords are and you can start ranking for those same things because as your compet like people are going to see your competitor's stuff, but then you'll start slowly but surely ranking up next to them because you're using the same keywords as them. So very, very important to do, but you only want to use five to seven keywords. That's what they say is the most optimal amount of keywords to use. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So creating a playlist, uh, again, this is another checkbox on the algorithm, but you want to have different playlists. Actually, for actually different somebody asked if you could repeat the, the steps for a keyword. Oh, yep. So for the keyword, to find the keywords on your competitor's page, you want to do right click on their YouTube channel, and then you want to uh, click view page source, and then you would just do command F and type in keywords, and then you'll see all of your competitors' keywords, um, what, they're, what they have input on there and what they're ranking for. So Command F on a Mac, Control F on a PC, I would assume. Okay, cool, so we got that answered. Um, the playlists, so again, that's a checkbox on the, on the algorithm. Uh, and just create the playlist based on different topics, right? Like this goes back to, you know, don't worry about the structure and the strategy of your, like what goes into the video, but like when it comes to your YouTube playlist, that's where you want to worry about the strategy. So for Media Pouch, we have, our playlist consists of vlogs, interviews, business, automotive, real estate, travel, uh, a couple other different ones, but it's all so that I'm ranking in those keywords at all times, right? Um, and then the next one that you can do, and this will save you a lot of time as well in the long run when you're posting all these videos, but let's say that you want people to, I don't know, check out your Instagram and Facebook page and your website and you know, this is where they can get a hold of you at, and this is the gear you used, and you know, whatever else you want to put on in the description on your YouTube video, you can just upload defaults into YouTube. And no matter what video you post, it'll always just populate in there. And it's a huge time saver. So I would highly recommend that. Uh, let's see. So channel branding. Um, this is actually a new one. I think it's been around for a while, but I actually just put ours on the channel a month ago because I just found out about it. But the channel branding, you can enable there to be, uh, you know, whatever picture you want to put on there. For us, we, I just put the logo, our logo on there, but it'll have your logo in the bottom right corner and people can just hit the subscribe button right there. But you're, it's kind of like a watermark on your video. And so there's always going to be that logo just sitting there on the right side of your bottom right corner of your video where people can easily subscribe, right? So you always want that to be in there because you want a way to connect with your audience and followers. Let's see, um, titles. So this is where you want strong keywords uh, mixed with what your audience is looking for. And this, this is where it starts to get a little time consuming and tricky and I mean, you can just go down a rabbit hole with finding the right keywords, but you know, you can use, I think it's called, um, adkeywords.com is the one I use or something like that where you can just, it's free and you just go in there and say like yesterday I posted the F45 video that we did. So I obviously like want to find the right keywords for, you know, gym or workout or training. And then I'm just looking at, you know, where can I, which keywords are the right ones for us? Because we don't want something that has a huge amount of competition and a huge amount of views, but we'd rather have something that has a lot of views and way less competition. And so that's what those keyword uh, websites are going to tell you. Let's see, and then the descriptions always fill out your descriptions, like put in as much as you can into the description because that's what's gonna help you rank your videos better on YouTube as well. Um, you know, so that's where the, the default upload comes in handy because, you know, say you write out like a very lengthy description of everything that you used and the gear and like 
all this other stuff that's trending, um, it's always going to go in there. And so you can save yourself time with that one. Um, but with descriptions, right? Like you want to really talk about what is going on there. So for example, the F45 video, you know, come experience what it's like to work out in a clean gym that is fully sanitized every single hour in Austin, Texas, you know, this team training where they offer 20 minute ab workouts and all this stuff, but it's, it's designed, the description is designed with keywords in there, like uh, sanitized. That was a trending one. Good keyword. Um, Austin is always a good one. And then um, what else was there? The, um, the clean gym, like, you know, you just want to put keywords in there that people are looking out for like 20 minute ab workout. That's one of the, that's a huge one right now. So just use stuff like that in your description and then thumbnails. Um, man, this one drives me nuts on Instagram and YouTube all the time from people because people don't select a thumbnail and I don't think it's because they, it's just because a lot of people don't know how to, but you can either upload a custom thumbnail JPEG, which is what I usually do 10 times out of 10. Um, but you just essentially like if you're pulling your, your thumbnail out of your video, all you would do is just take a picture of that exact point in premiere. And then you would just upload that as your thumbnail. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then YouTube allows YouTube will recommend what thumbnail that it thinks it should be. And then you can just click one of those, but, um, it's usually not the best quality. And I would highly recommend steering away from that and just uploading your own custom thumbnail of something. And then let's see how often to post. And I've done a lot of research on this and um, it really just depends what your goals are. Because if you want to really grow a big audience very, very fast, then you need to be posting one video every single day at the optimal times, which is around 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you're just trying to grow at a normal rate, then you want to be posting one good quality video per week. Um, that allows your viewers to set, uh, you know, they know when to look for your content, they know when it's coming, and they know it's going to be a good video packed with a bunch of value and content. And I would say that's typically how we do it is just the one video per week. Um, you know, I'm not very concerned with growing a YouTube channel because again, like our, what we do is make videos. So like as soon as everybody that we work for, they post our videos and our content. So like it, it's like a reverse engineer for us, but um, for everybody else, like I would highly recommend, you know, one to two a week, you know, and using the keywords and just put in the work that four hours per week, you know, create it, research it and do all that good stuff. Any questions on that? <laughs> because that wraps it up for the YouTube section. I have a question. Yes. I hope I'm not annoying you. I keep talking. No, you're good. I love the questions. <laughs> I love it. I'm one of those people that sits in the front when I go to a training. <laughs> um, the thumbnail. Is yeah. there a spec on format and dimensions? Uh, the only, there's not, not dimensions and format, but it always just has to, um, I believe it, Oh man, it's something very low because I always end up having to do um, a compression. It's a website and it just compresses the image down to where it needs to be for you. But it's like 100 megabytes. Or something. Okay. So like if I export as a PNG, it usually does a really low compression. Is that, but then I don't have to worry about the dimensions of the, like the actual like pixel size by pixel size. Then. No, you just want it to be like, if you're exporting a, a JPEG from your video, um, it, it's usually pretty, it's usually good and you'll be able to upload it as a thumbnail, but sometimes you just have to go to like JPEG compression.com and it'll compress it for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I have one more section with, um, you know, taking all of this and then turning it into our process and kind of some real life examples of how this works. And then we will, we'll wrap it up, but real quick, I just need to run to the restroom. So give me two minutes. <laughs> okay. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs>
This has been really great. Um, I don't know if you're following on the chat. I'm trying to take notes for everybody. Um, we are recording this session. Um, so I will be able to email the recording. Um, and so you'll be able to uh, kind of zero in on some of the more technical stuff that he was talking about. Um, but also hopefully I'll be able to uh, capture the chat and send that to you as well because um, he's got the link to his gear. Um, it's about, um, let's see what, uh, let's see, where is it? It's, um, it's at the 6.30 mark in the chat. So if you scroll, if you came in late um, or, or um, had to step out and come back in, at the 6.30 mark, um, he put in the link to the smart gear recommendations and uh, looks great because there's um, the microphones and the, the iPhone um, uh, lens and all this great stuff, the lighting. And um, so I highly recommend click on that and save that to your bookmarks. Um, and like I said, I'm trying to take uh, notes. So hopefully we'll be able to get you the chat and the recorded session um, in a couple of days. So in case you missed anything or in case you had to check out and come back in if you missed anything or if uh, he got real technical on us and uh, we missed something. All right, looks like he's back. All right, there we go. Just adjusting my lighting through my blinds right there. <laughs> um, okay, I, don't, I didn't hear what you guys talked about amongst yourself, but is there We've, um, I just reminded them that you have a link to your gear and okay. that we are going to share uh, the recorded session um, after I've been able to kind of clean it up a little and send it out to everybody. Okay, gotcha. Okay, well, I'll try to, I'll try to keep this last part um, short and simple for you guys since it's just pretty much an overview. Um, you know, of the process that we take in order to get the results that we do. And it can be applied at any, any level, like legitimately it can. Um, so you always, you know, we don't create videos unless there's a, some specific kind of result that we're trying to get out of it for our clients or for us. So always keep that in your head. Like don't, you know, try to create vid content and build a library, but also make sure that you're doing it for a reason and a result and you're not just filming various things that aren't going to really do anything for anybody, you know, make sure that there's a result in mind. Um, and so really we start with visualizing and that's storyboarding. Like every single project that we work on, it's, we write everything out. Like what are the shots that we want? What do we want them to talk about? Like what is in that shot? And so really visualize your video before you start shooting it. Um, and then we call the next step architect, right? And that's the actual production. So what gear are we using? Am I using this blue Yeti mic, like the camera, think about what's going into your setup on this one and then delivering, um, that's your post-production, right? Like that's where all of your editing happens, all of the transitions and effects and everything like that. How are you exporting it? What platforms is it going on? Um, and then distribution. Uh, I think this is super important and I didn't get into it for um, the main reason of that it's a it's a huge huge topic and you can't it's impossible to cover even the slightest on it. But distribution comes down to your marketing plan. Like, where are you posting this thing? How are you posting it? How are people going to engage with it? It the whole nine yards, right? Like, how are you actually going to optimize this video to get you the result that you want it to get for you or your client or whatever? Um, but I can tell you this much that we typically create two videos and one of them is the hype video. And that's what, that's what brings your audience in, right? Like if you're scrolling through Facebook or Instagram and you see a cool video and you're like, oh, wow, like that looks like some good ice cream. And, but it's like this really intense hype video for the most part. Like it's always something, you know, in this example, like somebody's eating some ice cream and it looks really good. Like that's your hype video. And I think every single person starting out in with video needs to create these two things. And it's the hype video to draw attention and 
And the next one is your video business card, essentially. And that's where you're just explaining to your audience what you do, like who you are, what you do and everything about you. Like, you know, you're trying to build a connection with them after they've seen that hype video and they've gone to your website or YouTube channel, you know, like explain to them what it is and who you are. Um, and so like between those two videos um, and even just regular vlog videos and YouTube videos, whatever, you know, just video in general, like this is why these things work and why I don't even call them videos. I, I call them video assets because realistically, like if you're doing this the right way and you're really utilizing video and marketing it and the whole nine yards, like they're truly assets and these things should be creating emotion. You know, I don't like, nobody's getting excited about PDFs. Like they're, they're really not, not like when somebody sends me uh, an e doc to sign, I'm like, Oh, this sucks. You know, but like nobody's sending videos like saying, Hey, we know this sucks, but you know, like this is what it's going to do. And this is all this, like imagine sending that with your documents, like uh, for somebody to sign or like explaining something like that is the power of these videos is, getting people to get excited about your process and doing what you need them to do. Um, it also, you know, what videos do is it pre-frames the meeting, the sale or the meetup or whatever. Um, I know that nine times out of 10, that whenever I go on a sales call with someone, they've already seen one of my videos. They've seen one of media pouches videos. Like they know who I am for the most part. Like I'm not going into the meeting cold and that's, that's what you want, right? Like, I, I don't know exactly what everybody's <clears throat> intentions are with starting out with video and, and branding purposes and stuff like that. But just think about how nice it would be to just walk in somewhere and people already know who you are and what you do and how you can help them. Like the power in that is unreal. So, you know, Keep that in mind when you're creating these videos and that's what you want the goal to be. And that's what they can do for you. And then they, um, the relationship, right? Um, they, the videos build a relationship with your potential client before you even meet them. And that's, that's what goes into pre-framing in the sale and kind of what I'm talking about, but they've already built that emotional and personal connection with you. So like they, they know everything, like there's kind of a relationship with you from them that you don't even know about yet until you meet with them. So very cool stuff on there. Um, the other big thing for videos is you're trying to build credibility, right? Like I can say that media pouch has built its credibility on providing results, you know, having the testimonials and actually, you know, having people talk about us to like other people and businesses, like that's where our credibility has come from. But the power, and this is, this is challenging, right? Like even as a media production owner, I, it's a challenge for me to get clients to get on video and give a testimonial because for the most part, you're in and out with videos. Um, and that's all business owners or entrepreneurs have time for. Like they're super busy people, but you want to grab as many testimonials about what you're doing as possible, even if it's like, you know, somebody who's credible in the space or a celebrity or like somebody that people look up to, um, if you can have them do a testimonial on video and you can put that somewhere, I mean, it's gold. I mean, it adds credibility and everything right to your brand and you know, who you are and what you're trying to do. Um, the, the other big thing that video does is that it saves time, right? The, the, FAQs and the testimonials and the video business cards, like those things are a virtual blueprint for what you're doing. Like you shouldn't have to explain to anybody anymore. You know, once you get to that certain point, like you've got all of these videos built out, like these things should be just working for you automatically. Like you should just be sending people to those videos. Like, yep, this is what I do. And this is how we can help. And these are all the people that have worked with us. And this is what they say. And you take all the doubt out about working with you all through videos. And it's like having 10 people on your sales team. So cool thing there. Um, let's see. Yeah. I mean, that's really all I have for you, but there's, there's a ton of power in these videos. Um, you know, I highly recommend everybody do them, you know, 
starting out in a pro, I think everybody in here is probably a nov at novice level, it seems like, um, just based on the, the questions that you guys were asking. But, you know, this is, I want to show you like this in two years, you know, that's where I'm at with Media Pouch and I built it from the ground up. But the results that we've seen, and these are real, is that the videos decrease balance rate, right? Like users spent 88% more time on clients' websites. So that means that they were looking there or buying there or shopping around there 88% longer than a regular website, which is unreal. Um, they had increased social share and awareness, so brand recognition. They had 66% more qualified leads when people watched their videos before they even met with them. Um, they had a 39% increase in sales revenue on average, and that's amongst all of our clients. Um, and then for specific industries, like we've helped, our videos have helped sell over $10 million in real estate. Like it's pretty nuts when you think about that videos sold $10 million in real estate. Like those agents, all they did was market the video. They didn't market the house, they marketed the video. Um, and then they've helped raise $2.5 million for startups. And most recently, our huge success was raising $85,000 in under three days of like, we posted a video and then in three days, um, the Squadra Foundation raised $85,000 through ticket sales, which is, it's unreal, right? You know, and just two days ago, El Cevichero, a new ceviche restaurant in in San Antonio, they posted their videos. They've got over 3,000 views on the video and he just got booked up. Like, I mean, he, he doesn't even have the capacity to make any more ceviche and he's got orders for this weekend already, which never happens. So it's the power of it all. So it's, what- It's the power I, of YouTube. And so you've given us like so much information. I just want to do one quick round. Um, does anybody have any last- um, questions for Ryan before um, before we let him free for the evening. You mentioned um, little short videos. Uh, what was the term? I put it in. Yeah, the I think chat. he called it video hype. A uh, hype video. Oh yeah. Do you have like guidelines for that? Like length, duration of the video, um, uh, content of it, things like I that. I don't have. I don't have a guideline because um, we make they're they're always different. But I'll I'll show you I'll put a link in here of of what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. Of one of our hype videos that we've done. Um, let's see here. Because I'm looking at releasing a podcast and I wanted to include some like hype videos, but that that's that's actually been my project for today to kind of research that. So you're touching on it really home right now with what I need to get done. Um, so that would be like those guys, is, that's their guys' hype video. And then I'll post in here the explainer video that goes right along with it. Bye. Okay. Bye. Mom. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, check those out. And that's exactly what I'm talking about with like a video business card and a... Oh, I think you sent it to me privately. Um, oh. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, there we go. There it is. And there we go. Got it. Okay, there we go. Anything else? Any other questions? Anything I didn't cover that you guys wanted to know about? Or I have a lot of questions, but I would take up a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> this has been really great, Ryan. Thank you so much. Um, no worries. Uh, the, the, you gave us a lot to think about, especially I think um, pre pre planning. So many of us just grab the phone and start shooting, um, and we tend to like overthink it I know I'm guilty of like thinking oh you know I my hair's not set just right or yeah all that kind of stuff um but I think uh I I, I do I think the lighting is it has has been really helpful the type of lighting yes um 
and um, the type of microphone. So you gave us a lot to think about and a lot to plan for. Good, good. Well, that, was, that was the point of it. And I think that um, I, I did, you know, it's all stuff that you know, if I do hindsight 2020. It's all stuff that I wish I would have known whenever I was starting out, right? Like the storyboarding part of it is, it makes a huge difference. Like if you know what you're going to shoot, then God, I mean, it just fast tracks everything. So that is true. Well, again, I want to thank you so much. Um, and uh, to the group, uh, we I have re I've recorded this session, and you can you can download the chat yourself. Um, I'll download it as well, and hopefully, I can get that to you. Um, and then, if you have additional questions, just send them to um, hello at keycoworking.com, and we will forward them to Ryan. Ryan, if you want to put in your contact information, if people want to contact you directly. Yeah, you guys are you guys are more than welcome to to reach out to me directly. Like if you like if you guys have questions, like if you guys are interested in working together, like it doesn't matter. Just reach out. So I will put our um, email in here, and then um, just shoot us an email. Like questions, doesn't matter, whatever it is. Um, if if you all signed up through Eventbrite, I can make sure you get the link to this. If you haven't, you can send me your email the chat and I'll make sure it gets to you too. Um, so those are those are both of our emails. That last one's my personal. The first one is the generic that goes out. Um, you know, anybody in the community can see. So. Well, thank you. Give Ryan a round of applause. Thank no you so Thanks much. You, thank you for all that info. No worries. It's my pleasure to share it all. Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, Michelle, Carla, thank you so much for having me on tonight and sponsoring this one. It's, uh, it was fun. This was the first virtual one I've done. I've done a lot of these physically, but uh, it's, it's a little bit different being on this side of the camera now and <laughs> looking that way when I've got the screens this way. So it, it, was, it was fun to, to test this all out tonight. It was very fun. Well, we, uh, we had a pleasure host, um, having you as our, our presenter.